in George Bosa, okay? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please come back into the room. We're going to start our next panel. As my mentor, David Kotak, told me, honor the people who come back into the room and the ones who are outside. Well, <laughs> they, they miss out. Uh, we have uh, three speakers uh, on this panel. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Dan Buxa, the economist from Unicredit, and then we're going to uh, Koize Koide, the chief economist of Diem in Japan, and then George Chichekos, who's the uh, dean emeritus of Drexel and the chairman of GIC. Uh, so we're going to go, oh, we're going to go Dan on Europe, George on Europe, and then Kozo on Japan. Okay, so we will start with uh, Dan Buxa from Unicredit. Stragglers will be shot. <laughs> That's John Sylvia's job. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation first. And I will talk briefly about Central and Eastern Europe. There was a mention earlier about emerging markets, and this is one of the regions people look at right now. And I would like to talk about growth drivers in, emerging in CE. And first of all, let's define CE. Unicredit is present throughout the region, so our definition is a bit wider, including new EU members, CIS, Turkey, and the Balkans. And what I will try to talk about is that the crisis hit CE economies through two main channels. One was financial flows, and I will briefly touch on sovereign borrowing funding for banks and foreign direct investment, and then external demand. And my argument is that the two constraints have subsided over the past couple of years, but they unfortunately remain in place. So I will start with sovereign borrowing. And over the past three years, we've seen a risk normalization process that has helped these countries borrow at lower interest rates. And we can see that uh, the fall in yields has on average been higher than the fall in uh, CDS uh, over the region. The exceptions are those countries that had huge imbalances during the crisis, uh, like huge current accounts deficit in Bulgaria, Romania, or Lithuania, or were very new to um, the debt market. What we see currently is that countries with a better risk assessment actually pay less in real terms. So it's worth having some good fundamentals in the economy when it comes to sovereign borrowing. And the correlation between CDS spreads, the change in CDS spreads and change in real yields is actually quite strong. The countries that currently pay the most are the countries that ha are seen by markets as being the most vulnerable. This huge interest in emerging markets has led currently to the highest share of domestic market total debt being held by foreign investors. A part of this 45% in Hungary, 37% in Poland, around 23% in Turkey and Romania, we've also seen a change in the structure of investors towards real money, and the funds, fund flows has been much more stable, especially in Poland and Turkey which are the outperformers in the region. I will now try to look at whether these very good flows towards the sovereign borrowers have had an impact on bank borrowing and on bank funding costs. And the answer is not really. Why is this important? Because previously to, previous to this huge interest from foreigners into uh, sovereign uh, debt in CE, local banks were the ones buying the, most of the sovereign debt. And although foreigners have come and now cover up to 50% of, um, of the sovereign uh, borrowing, banks still have some constraint in, constraints in place. And we should think about it this way. These 
current countries used to run huge current account deficits that had to adjust to higher savings rates, and these higher savings rates entailed higher interest rates uh, throughout the region. Meanwhile, lending rates went down much more than savings rates, basically because demand was so low for, uh, for lending, and banks tried to adjust. And the overall impact was that in most of the countries in the region, interest spreads and also profits for the banking system went down. With lower profits, the actual inflows from parent banks into the region were much lower throughout 2012. And we've actually seen a worsening of the situation over the last uh, quarter of the year versus um, Q3. So with no money from parent banks, it means that reviving lending is based only on local savings. And even this rebound, the small rebound we, we, you can see in lending, comes uh, only in Turkey and Russia. The rest of the region actually lacks. And I will do a bit of history to explain why Turkey and Russia and not the others. And I will start comparing 2007 to 1999. And this is foreign claims of EU banks, the most important investors in the region, in CE. And you can see that these claims rose sharply between 1999 and 2007, sometimes 45 times higher. Of course, there was a very low uh, start, so uh, there's also this base effect. But the lowest investments in terms of um, money, new money uh, taken to, to CE were actually in Russia and Turkey before the crisis. After 2007, we've seen a sharp correction of fund flows from banks. And of course, the, those countries that got most of the money before the crisis were the countries that lost some money during the crisis. And looking at the actual euro uh, inflows, we can see that only five countries got inflows between 2010 and 2012. And there are several explanations to that. The countries that still receive money from uh, parent banks in Europe were those that were growing. Those where banks had a very low present before the a presence before the crisis, hence very low loan to deposit ratios. So the leverage of the foreign banks in those countries were very low. Just to wrap up what this means in terms of uh, banking flows right now. Turkey and Russia are the countries that grew the most over the past couple of years, and they have the best outlook for growth going forward. Poland got most of the funding between 2007 and 2010 because it avoided the crisis altogether. And the rest of the countries um, are very lucky if they will see funds remaining at the current levels going forward. We've seen a huge adjustment in loan to deposit ratios all over the region. And I will just point to Hungary, where the loan to deposit ratio went from 180% in 2007 to 110 now, and it will definitely go to 100 in a matter of less than two years. So switching to FDI, foreign direct investment halved from pre-crisis peaks, and if we leave Russia aside, you can see that foreign funding right now is less than 40 billion to the entire region. Even countries with very good growth performances like Turkey get on average 1% of GDP per year in foreign direct investment. If this is the new normal, it means that these countries will have to adjust on a longer term to lower potential growth rates. Luckily for some of them, there are EU funds that they can access. And some of the countries like Poland and the Baltics managed to offset lower FDI through these EU fund inflows. In some of the countries, these EU fund inflows amount to three to 5% of GDP. For the countries that did not manage to get this money, like Romania, the rest of the Balkans, and even the Czech Republic, we do ask ourselves, which will be the growth drivers going forward. Low FDI has an impact on the biggest growth driver in the region, which is industry and export. 
And you can see that the average contribution to growth per annum in this region has ranged from 0.2% in Croatia to almost 3.3% in Romania. And the industry GDP overall has a much higher share than in the Euro area or the European Union. So Euro, Euro area and European Union are around 15.5%, while some of the countries go up to 30. Now, I would like just to look at the colors <laughs> in this chart, not the countries. Red is car manufacturing. These are the most important five exports for nine countries in the region. Black is oil, and pink shades are manufacturing of uh, machinery and equipment. What it tells you is that in five countries, car exports are the most important. And in most of these countries, the share of car exports is growing. Also, what it tells you is that the manufacturing of machinery and equipment is more and more important in all these countries. And that product diversification happened during the crisis in most of these countries with the big exception of Russia. Russia is still dependent on oil, gas, and electricity. Looking at the main export partners, again, I would like you to look at the colors because black is Germany and red is Russia. All gray shades are countries from the European Union. So Germany is the most important trading partner for sev six out of, of these nine countries. Um, moreover, Germany accounts to almost a third of Czech exports and more than 25% in Hungary and Poland. Meanwhile, Russia is a big trading partner only for Bulgaria because uh, the Bulgaria manufactures some uh, oil products and for Turkey to a lesser extent for Hungary and Poland. And I would like to point out to something else. Both France and Italy are losing share dramatically in exports, uh, in CE exports. And you can look at Romania where the share of Italy halved between 2002 and 2012. We've tried to look at the impact on industry of the structure of uh, trading partners, and we've weighted industrial production in the trading partners with the weights in uh, this country's exports. And what we can see right now is that the Euro area and Western Europe is actually a drag on growth for most of these countries. And I will show you another chart that says the same thing. This is the change of share in exports towards the Euro area in some of these countries. And you can see that between 2009 and 2012, the euro area has actually lost as a share of exports. So it was rather a drag on growth than one of the biggest growth drivers as it was before the crisis. The only exception is Slovenia, and not by chance, but because it's the most expensive country in the region in terms of prices. Where did exports go? Well, exports went outside the European Union for most of the countries. Incidentally, the numbers for Turkey are adjusted. Uh, we left aside gold exports towards Iran and Iraq because they were messing up the charts. But if you look at the other countries, they managed to sell more outside the European Union, and we're talking here not only the Middle East and China, but also uh, North Africa and South America. And this means that these countries had to be price competitive. And these are the unit labor costs in the region. You can see that before the crisis, bef between 2000 and 2008, these unit labor costs rose dramatically throughout the region with the exception of Russia. But then they corrected during the crisis. And I will give you just some numbers. I know there are official numbers and we can debate uh, on them. But before the crisis in 2007, the average official wage in China was half the average official wage in Romania. Now it's actually higher. So the adjustment in unit labor costs in the region has probably been one of the most dramatic throughout the world. And it has been coupled with an adjustment in productivity. These countries are now, on average, more productive than they were before the crisis. It was a small adjustment 
uh, in 2008 and 2009, but then productivity grew between 5 and 20 percent, especially in Central Europe. What are my conclusions to this presentation? The crisis forced CE countries to adjust to imbalances, and these imbalances were high loan to deposit ratios, also higher labor costs, and because of this adjustment, domestic demand suffered, but also budget and current account deficits fell throughout the region. These adjustments were needed in order to compete on non EU markets, which is the new growth driver for CE growth. And there is great differentiation among CE countries in coping with constraints in recovering after the crisis and also in accessing foreign financing. And we think that this differentiation will um, grow over the next years. Thank you. Uh, George? Yes. Um, my discussion today has to do with the European Union and uh, recent developments. It appears that uh, global financial and market conditions can, have improved in the last six months for reasons that I don't really fully understand, to be frank with you, because the issues of concerns about the European breakup are still present. So what I would like to do is just to give you a, an overview of uh, where we were perhaps eight months ago or a year ago, where concerns about fragmentation, that is breakup, is a very sophisticated word for the European Union, were present. And then all of a sudden today, there is a positive climate. Towards the end of my presentation, I will talk about a forgotten sector, which is the corporate sector. Everybody talks about the banking sector in Europe. Everybody is concerned about the funding in the corporate and private sector. But at the end of the day, growth comes from the corporate sector. And by understanding better the conditions in the corporate sector in the European Union, we can make assessments or projections to what extent there is a possibility for the European Union to get out of, of the current recessionary pressures that it faces. So um, the difficulties of the union are associated with an ambiguous design, we know that, of an economic system that is based primarily on, on the notion of a currency union, uh, when in fact we know all the currency unions in the past have been um, uh, dissolved. Um, the difficulty is also associated with a lack of fiscal convergence, and which is attributed to uh, cultural differences, differences in perceived priorities ac across different countries. Uh, perhaps I'm repeating information that you are familiar with. And uh, those kind of things, they have led to a serious asymmetric development between the North and the South. The North is considered the, the core countries of the European Union, whereas the South are the club met countries um, which include uh, some, you know, my beloved country of Greece, some parts of uh, France, I guess, Spain, Portugal, and uh, Ireland sometimes. Um, there is uh, issues of credibility associated with the European Union as the decision making is quite fragmented or diversified, I would say, be between politicians and others. So it's a, it's a difficult kind of a thing to find out uh, how the European Union will be uh, in a position to overcome those economic challenges and difficulties. Um, so the three key concerns, I would say, is the three R's from my perspective, how to reverse financial fragmentation, the breakup, how to reverse asymmetries, and how to restore stability in the region. These are the three things that have been discussed quite extensively, uh, uh, to avoid breakup and thus chaos, the European Union should develop mechanism for fiscal convergence. The three most important concerns for the survival of the Europe and uh, the Euro, in fact, are associated 
with uh, uh, those three attributes that I have outlined here. Uh, I must say that uh, in case where you are not aware, sim these are some of the things that have occurred uh, as a result of the possibility of the breakup of Europe, of Europe, of the European Union. Uh, capital flight to safer, to safer Eurozone countries was uh, uh, something that we observed in the last two years. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of funds move from the periphery to the core. Current, serious current account imbalances in uh, various uh, countries, uh, especially in the periphery. Private uh, capital that has been uh, replaced by public sector flows, as we have seen a lot of issuance of uh, sovereigns. Uh, funding asymmetries, the corporate costs are very, very high now compared to the costs for even sovereigns. And uh, another issue that has been uh, identified is the liquidity in the core that has been attributed the, to the European Central uh, Bank's uh, decisions have not been recycled to the periphery, where the periphery needed to have much more liquidity in order to avoid uh, issues of funding in the private sector. Um, Taking a step back, if you see the global markets, uh, you will see that the, the, it's, uh, the size is, uh, is approximately 250 uh, trillion uh, in terms of, um, of total size that includes the stock market capitalization, the debt securities, and the bank assets. And during this period of time, from 2002, pre-crisis, after crisis, what we observe, we, we observe more and more uh, accumulation of debt securities at the expense of uh, uh, valuations or stock market uh, capitalization. So which shows that uh, the prevalence of uh, uh, sovereign debt and, and corporate debt uh, to dominate uh, uh, you know, the, the total, uh, uh, the global financial system along with the fact that you have more bank assets, uh, which is a reflection of the fact that those banks they have tried to expand their balance sheet. Uh, also, over this period of time, from 08 to 09 until today, uh, if you see the cumulative flows to global mutual funds, just the segment of the financial markets, and during the, the different periods of times, global bonds have been expanded drastically at the expense of advanced economy equities where uh, initial public offerings and uh, 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 stock offerings as well have declined over a period of time. Now, what is very interesting between the core and the periphery in the European Union, if we come, ba come back, is an observation that the investment capital flows in the, Europe, uh, in the Euro area on a cumulative basis as a percentage of the uh, of the GDP have increased substanti substantially to the core, there is a flow of funds to the core, at the expense of reductions in the periphery, which means that a, lo a lot of funds have moved, as I initially indicated, from the periphery to the core, to the safer core countries, especially Germany. Uh, as a result, or perhaps because of the perceived uncertainties, the premiums associated with all the spreads on the credits of the periphery versus the core has, have been moving in the right direction, the anticipated direction, where you see uh, substantial, uh, substantial premiums uh, on the uh, sovereigns uh, along with the uh, non-financial uh, firms. Now, as a result of the crisis, one important uh, consequence was the capital flight, that is, especially deposits that they left the periphery and they move to the center. And these are some of the, of the countries that you can see, Greece especially, uh, Ireland and Spain, where you can see a, uh, a comparison of the deposits at the peak time as opposed to a few months later uh, how much those countries, in terms of deposits, they have lost. Uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, let's say, Greece, which is the favorable, favorable country here, they lost almo almost 30% of their deposits, uh, which had 
impacted, of course, the funding in the corporate sector and created the all sorts of anomalies in the local market. Uh, some additional difficulties experienced in Ireland and uh, even in Spain, we have a reduction of almost 10% in the total deposits. And those deposits uh, did not disappear in the market, but they moved to the core uh, banking sector. Uh, this shows the differences between the, um, uh, the yields of the creditor and debtor uh, countries in the European Union. And uh, this information really indicates how the premia associated with the uh, debtor countries. They have to pay more compared to the creditor countries and the difference is substantial. And the exposure, the uh, euro area exposure to Greece, to the periphery I would say, Italy, Portugal and Spain has been augmented uh, from 09 to uh, uh, 12. This is a, at the end of 12. Uh, and this has been augmented due to the uh, European Central Bank borrowing, uh, which is a substantial, you know, if you look on the size, is, uh, is almost 25-30% uh, uh, increase. Now, how this crisis can be resolved, theoretically, uh, the leverage in, uh, it's uh, in place with the recapitalization of the banks, uh, a lot of asset write downs in the, ba uh, in the banking sector, but the total cost has been estimated based on three scenarios that have been identified by uh, IMF, anywhere between 2.8 trillion to 4.5 trillion, on average $3.6 trillion. Now, someone needs to think how this money is gonna come from, from where this money uh, will be arriving in the doors of the European Union uh, in a way that they would be able to address the deleveraging pressures and the crisis that they face. So, more to come, but uh, there are several policy prescriptions. Everybody knows about those prescriptions or uh, recommendations. The difficulty is in the implementation phase. Uh, we know that sovereigns and banks need to be safer. It's common sense. Uh, fiscal convergence, for the sovereigns, difficult to be implemented with all these political uncertainties. Uh, they need to adopt growth enhancing institutional reforms. We know that. They have been discussing those issues for years. Sometimes it's boring to discuss the same things. And they need to further develop banking institutions that make a lot of sense, uh, especially insurance and other elements that complete the financial infrastructure. Are they, they are gonna be successful? No, but especially Greece is not gonna be successful in my mind as it faces the three Ds, which is significant debt accumulation, huge public sector deficits that still uh, uh, you know, are persistent, and ambiguous development, an ambiguous development model. So these are the macro, macro levels, but at the European Union, but somehow, in the last six months, we have a euphoria developed in the European Union that has crossed the Atlantic. And this euphoria is based on three elements, I would say. One is policy commitments that have been made. We don't know if they will be executed by the Europeans. Number two, renew monetary stimulus. We know that. And number three, based on the continuous liquidity adjustments or uh, support that has been presented by European Central Bank. So for those kind of things to be presented to us as positive is very good, but uh, continuous improvements is required, and this means that the Europeans should uh, make serious adjustments in the uh, balance sheet and repair the balance sheets of financial institutions uh, in the European Union and uh, they have to reduce in a smooth way both the public and private, uh, 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 private debt uh, uh, overhanging issue that is the excessive debt that appears to be in, uh, in Europe. So I want to spend just a few more minutes to talk about what it means to reduce the debt 
and to what extent it's possible to reduce the debt in the corporate sector in Europe. Everybody knows what needs to be done in the banking sector, but the corporate sector is the one that somehow we have neglected. And the corporate sector in Europe is very important because it, gr it drives growth and profitability. Uh, it drives uh, profitability and future potential investments. So on the supply side, uh, for the corporate sector, the credit conditions in the periphery have declined substantially. The credit growth has declined by almost 10%. So there is no more money to finance uh, expansion and growth in the corporate sector in the periphery, not in the core. In the core, the levels of credit and the availability of credit remain stable. But in the periphery where they need the growth, the uh, supply of credit has de de declined substantially, number one. Number two, the rates in the periphery have increased much more than whatever they, had the, uh, they were prior to the crisis, actually by 325 basis points compared to the rates for the corporate sector in the core. So this asymmetry creates lack of competitiveness, of, of course, something that is much needed now in the periphery for the corporate uh, uh, sector to grow and to expand. Uh, in addition, the periphery, the corporate sector in the periphery is exposed to excessive leverage. And I'm saying that excessive leverage because uh, the corporate debt in the periphery has increased by almost 100% compared to the pre-crisis levels. Whereas in the core, the growth is consistent with what's happening in the United States, which is very close to 25 to 30%. So you have a periphery with a corporate sector that has excessive accumulation of, of debt, and this is not the end of the story because along with that, the next question is, can you service the debt? So two indications that we have for that is uh, the uh, interest coverage, that is how many times the earnings before interest cover the interest expenses on the corporate debt, and the other is uh, to what extent the debt to assets ratios are within a reasonable level that can be sustained in the medium term. So the interest coverage ratio uh, in many periphery countries are really in very bad shape. Uh, usually you expect this ratio to be above two, three, et cetera. Uh, and let me give you some disturbing numbers. In Italy, Portugal, and Spain, 30% of the firms, one third of corporates, they have an interest coverage which is less than one. They cannot service 30%, one third. In France and Germany, the opposite, the core, it's only 6% of the corporates, only six. In the United States, very close to five. The other element which is disturbing as well is the percentage of firms with a high leverage and low interest cover coverage ratios as well. Both are those negative signals. In Portugal, it's approximately 20% of the corporates, of the, uh, all corporations. In Ireland and Spain, 15%. And I'm not gonna give you the number in Greece because it's gonna be really Greek to you. In Italy, it's only 8%, and in US and Germany is only 1%. Uh, so given all these circumstances, someone can look on the what we call the free cash flow of companies, that is cash flow which can be adjusted for depreciation, the payments of amortization, and other extraneous factors that might signify the ability of the firms to sustain a level of debt that has been absorbed over a period of time. Now, what is the percentage of firms that they have high leverage in a country and a negative cash flow, net cash flow? 
believe it or not, Portugal, 50% of the firms. Spain, 40% of the firms. Greece, you want to hear the number, 85%. Italy, 20%. And US, very close to 3%, along with Germany, or 5%. So collectively, and I gave you a, a lot of numbers, I'm sorry I don't have my presentation with the colors and, and graphs. What it shows here that the a neglected uh, factor or impact of the crisis in the Eurozone is what's happening now in the corporate sector. The corporate sector has been over leveraged in the periphery, not in the core. And in the periphery, what is needed is to have a healthy corporate sector that can be supported by the banking sector that already is an MS with the recapitalizations and other extraneous factors. A corporate sector that cannot really service its own obligations has in several countries negative uh, free cash flow and excessive leverage and less and less ability to service current debt levels. So f my, um, uh, I guess, uh, prediction is not very positive about potential of growth in Europe, but what is d demonstrates I is again the argument that European Union has uh, has been fragmented. There are two different countries within a huge area, the Eurozone area. The periphery is suffering substantially, and the core is doing all right. So under these circumstances, the issue of fragmentation is going to come back again, in my view. It has not gone away despite the euphoric expectations that have been developed. And this is my outlook that might be challenged, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll switch gears to uh, Kozo Koide, who will cover uh, Japan and Abenomics. Uh, thank you very much. Toward last summer, to me, an overseas market, my clients almost lost the interest in Japan, my country, but uh, thanks to the new uh, Prime Minister Abe, suddenly the uh, demand for the Japanese uh, macroeconomists has uh, dramatically elevated since last year, so therefore I'm quite lucky to be here again in uh, lovely city Milan. The last December, uh, I took the honor to host the GIC meeting in Tokyo. Uh, already some of the audience here, uh, 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 John or uh, Kellen, uh, have got some possible uh, uh, structure change of the government policy mix, uh, but I myself uh, did not uh, expect this kind of large uh, swing of the monetary policy taken by the new board members of the uh, BOJ. But one thing I remind you, the keynote speaker of the Japan session at GIC in the last December was the Director General of uh, Economic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Director General of Industrial Policy at Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry, Mr. Yanase, is now assigned for Secretary of Prime Minister Abe. So therefore he was uh, definitely one of the key person. So this government is much more growth-oriented, growth-driven uh, uh, body uh, in the bureaucrat uh, 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 institutions. So, <coughs> 17 minutes left. The Abe repeatedly announced that uh, so-called the uh, new uh, policy initiative taken by the new government have uh, three LOs, I would say, pillars. One is a bold monetary policy. Without no doubt, the monetary policy is one of the focal point in the last uh, uh, several months. The second uh, pillar was uh, fiscal spending. Uh, they already committed to maintain a very high level of fiscal spending after the tsunami e disaster two years ago. And the lastly, they already committed to de disclose some uh, policy package uh, uh, of the so-called growth strategy, including the deregulation toward the end of this June, right before the upper house election. But uh, before the upper house election, uh, already the new government committed to start uh, a TPP negotiation, most aggressive free trade regime uh, just initiated by the Asian country together with the United States, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, before uh, the election time. It was just uh, a positive uh, uh, news uh, for me. 
And already he, the same uh, kind of charge was uh, just introduced by the David, uh, but I just here introduced the uh, uh, EOA change of monetary base by the red line, and the blue thin line is the banknotes or currency in circulations, and the gap between the two was the uh, green uh, uh, bar. So therefore, up until the late uh, 1990s, the basic uh, stance taken by the BOJ is accommodative, reactive monetary policy, just a chase for uh, chasing for the uh, banknote uh, growth, uh, uh, just in control of the, uh, uh, in managing the uh, monetary base. Uh, in 2006, just David uh, introduced the uh, Bank of Japan, deduct a huge liquidity out of the system, but after that, back to the zero interest rate policy, and after the uh, new uh, governor, Kuroda, uh, inaugurated, uh, uh, the uh, growth of the monetary base accelerated since the, uh, this uh, April. They said the, uh, this time around, not the, this is a QE, but the qualitative easing, a totally different level of easing. They committed to double the amount of the monetary base in two years' time, and also purchase of JGB with longer uh, duration. Now the average duration of the portfolio investment of the BOJ is three years, but that they will extend uh, the duration to seven years. Uh, so e e e right now, the uh, purchase, month monthly purchase of BOJ is 70% of uh, new issue of the JGB. Uh, actually, they are just soaked up uh, the JGB from the market right now. But looking back uh, in the discussion of the era of the previous Governor Shiraka of the BOJ, repeatedly they e just uh, uh, emphasize that there is a very, very limited doom, uh, room uh, to lift up the economy uh, from the central bank uh, under the zero interest uh, uh, rate together with the deflation, long-lasted uh, deflation. This is the uh, relationship between monetary base and the money supply, uh, namely the credit multiplier. Credit multiplier is heading down to the historical law after the uh, inauguration of the new governor, Kroda. So therefore, th the uh, mechanism from the balance sheet from the central bank to the uh, money, uh, uh, marginal change of the money supply has dramatically weakened in the last 15 years. And also the relationship between the CPI and the mo uh, money supply is also hazy. This is the dotted line of the uh, CPI and the M2. The y-axis is the CPI core, annual inflation, and the uh, <coughs> x-axis is showing the annual growth of M2. The present process already it touched upon, maybe the uh, uh, relationship uh, between these two elements is nonlinear in the long run. But this dotted line of the just the uh, uh, more than three decades uh, relationship between the two since the 1980s. Uh, if you allow me to draw the uh, simple uh, <coughs> linear trend line, that makes sense. But the blue dotted line is a relationship between the two under the deflation. Almost there's no logical uh, relationship, the flattish. Of course, in the longer run, the relationship is nonlinear exponentially. Sometime in the future, dynamically, that will some there will be some jump. But uh, uh, the intersection of a two percent inflation and this uh, thin blue line uh, required a uh, rate of uh, uh, money supply is sixty four percent per annum. So therefore, relationship between the money supply and money uh, and money and the CPI, both two relationships were dramatically weakened in the last fifteen years under the deflation, so therefore don't to, uh, put too much pressure upon the uh, BOJ to do something. That was the uh, opinion taken by the previous uh, governor. But the new uh, governor, Cloda, says, no, no, there is still some elbow room for us to do something. Uh, three channel, one is the interest rate channel. Uh, although the uh, BOJ increased the uh, purchase of the go uh, government bond from the market enormously, but still the duration is shorter. So therefore, why don't, you, why don't we extend the uh, purchase to the much more longer in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Maybe uh, that will help the uh, uh, economic activity. The second channel already, uh, the Catherine uh, make a question uh, regarding to the comment of the John in the previous panel, but the portfolio rebalancing uh, channel. A lot of uh, uh, pension sponsor, my clients, uh, to have the defined benefit contribution. Because of the deflation, uh, the committed rate is only around 1.4 or 1.5%. So if that's the case, 70% of the allocation of their money to the JGB makes sense. But suppose the new BOJ pushed down longer in the credit uh, uh, yield curve, they should deduct a large amount of money out of the JGB portfolio to, do, to some, somewhere else. Uh, presumably some fixed income uh, market. 
partly in uh, uh, European uh, government bonds debt market, government debt market. And thirdly, expectation channel. That is a controversial part. And uh, I understand that there is some uh, study, experimental study, uh, to search upon the possible direct relationship between the balance sheet size and the expected inflation in the market, household, the corporations. <coughs> so uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, hard to uh, just identify from the back low. I just uh, posted it in the website of the GIC. Uh, I just, uh, by, just for uh, references, I use the uh, very naive time series analysis, so-called the bilateral Ranger causality test, whether there is a linear uh, direct relationship from the change of the balance sheet of the uh, central bank uh, to the expected inflation in the household, corporation, the market. Uh, but I'm sorry, we, Japan, has only very, very short historical track record in the TIPS market. Uh, so therefore, this uh, uh, analysis was just based upon the uh, 16 quarters time, so therefore, just for a reference. I'm sorry. This is the size change in the multi base. <coughs> uh, in the last uh, at least 16 uh, quarters, that there is no direct uh, relationship or causality from the uh, size of the balance sheet to the uh, expected inflation by the corporation, the household. But at least there is a very clear and strong, straightforward relationship from the change in monetary policy, the topics, the equity price. So therefore, a uh, large supply of liquidity in the banking system will change the risk premium in the asset market, such as the uh, equity market or foreign exchange market. So indirectly, uh, the uh, QE would change uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the household expectation, the inflation, through the change of the topics uh, or the uh, foreign exchange rate, if possible. So this is the expected inflation in uh, Japan household and the corporate. The left chart is the diffusion index of the household. Diffusion index is the number of the household who says the uh, inflation is coming, deducted uh, minus the number of the households who said that still the deflation is uh, just uh, uh, exist. Uh, so net out uh, position of the expected inflation just uh, uh, bottom out in the last three months time. And right chart is expected sales price diffusion index, the same kind of notion gauged by the uh, uh, BOJ, a quarterly basis uh, survey. And uh, uh, recent uh, leading is uh, a one of the largest jump in this history in the sales price expectation. But uh, just uh, away from the expectation theory, I am not so pessimistic about the Japanese exit from the deflation in the two years' time based upon the real economy, not the monetary phenomenon. <coughs> First of all, I just have a discussion with uh, Michael Drewley at the uh, uh, dinner uh, table the last night. Uh, basically, the deflation and the inflation uh, should uh, be based upon the uh, conventional uh, GDP gap uh, analysis. And right now, the cabinet office says that we have the 4 trillion yen aggregated uh, uh, shortage of the final demand in the past. Uh, former Governor Shirakawa, when he retired, he, he made a speech uh, that to say that the uh, <laughs> GDP gap is minus 2%. B uh, the assessment by the cabinet was 4%, and BOJ's assessment is 2%. My <coughs> estimation is only 1.6%. Uh, it's a little bit technical story, but the left chart shows uh, you some uh, flavor of my argument. The uh, red chart, red line is a production capacity index, uh, just uh, the number of the corporation who says the capital stock of fixed assets held by the corporation is excessive, minus the number of the corporation who says there is an e inefficient in the capital stock held by my corporations. So therefore, net position of the DI is a kind of capacity utilization rate. And we have another different data set, manufacturing capacity utilization index based upon the capital stock data. So technically, uh, these two nations uh, should uh, move uh, uh, in line. But uh, after the Lehman shock, suddenly these two lines are deviated uh, further. Uh, I just uh, am very curious about that. And in short, uh, the manufacturing capacity is based upon the official report from the company. When, if the Panasonic or Sharp uh, will officially write off the bad asset of the balance sheet, they will report that uh, uh, write off to the uh, Office of Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry. At that stage, the capacity will be deleted from the official number. 
But as far as the, uh, there's no write-off from the asset by the Sharp or Panasonic, still the capacity is on the uh, official data. So therefore, it's uh, ridiculous to talk about the inflation deflation story. And secondly, the cabinet office uh, says that we, e, they are just using the maximum output potential, not the middle of the low output potential. So therefore, we f if we adjust, maybe the uh, uh, gap, uh, uh, the GDP gap is much more smaller. And uh, Dan touched upon the uh, unit labor cost about Romania and uh, China, and another uh, unit labor cost or, uh, story about China. The left chart is a unit labor cost of China. Still, uh, they are soaring uh, more than 40% per annum. Uh, from the 2005, in my calculation, in China, unit labor cost was tripled. But in Japan, there's only 4% four infla four inflation. And white chart is original data I just experimentally figured out. But the consumer price index of Japan weighted average by the import from China. Uh, do these two line is uh, just the shape is almost identical. So therefore, again, uh, the China's, uh, Chinese uh, uh, cheap uh, uh, export was scattered around all over the world, but Japan thoroughly was annoyed by the deflation. So therefore, this is not the major reason, the main reason, but still, uh, looking back in the last decade, the cheap import from China was definitely one of the leverage for the Japanese corporation to cut the price in the domestic market to change the uh, competitive atmosphere or condition in Japan. But there's almost no deflation uh, caused by the uh, 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 Chinese cheap import because of the unit labor cost uh, inflation. Yan rolling on. And uh, David, last night, he's sleeping, maybe he's tired, but uh, David uh, last night says that his uh, estimation of the foreign exchange rate of the two, uh, one, 120, but this morning he changed his view to 140. So the, uh, the exchange rate story is uh, 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 well, uh, it's difficult for all the uh, macro fundamentals, but uh, le left chart is the uh, interest rate differentials and the uh, yen exchange rate. Uh, from the uh, year 2004, th these uh, two lines fit well, uh, but recently there is no change of uh, interest rate differentials, but the yen began to depreciate further. The right chart is uh, interest rate differentials in real term and expected inflation, break even inflation gap between the two countries. Since the last October, that's those two lines hit fit uh, very well. So therefore in the United States, uh, FOMC members are now talking, uh, discussing about the uh, potential fertilized exit policy in the future, but in my country, total rate situation is the other way around. So therefore, maybe it, uh, today's uh, a trend of depreciation of yen will be supported by the uh, gap between the two countries' expected monetary policy. And also, uh, Japan is not more and more large surplus countries. Uh, so there's about a one uh, year uh, time lag between the external imbalances and the yen uh, uh, movement in the past. But in the last two years, uh, uh, suddenly the uh, yen uh, uh, relationship with the external uh, imbalance was uh, uh, just changed after the uh, uh, Greek crisis. Uh, the sensitivity of the Greek government bond in the yen dollar exchange rate was suddenly elevated. I'm sure that there's no direct and tight economic relationship between the Japan and the Greek. The only logic is when there's very bad thing in the national market, Japan or Japanese yen or Swiss franc market is the best place to be. But if uh, uh, the uh, uh, crisis in the euro e will be eased bit by bit, why don't you sell the yen against other major currencies? That's one of the explanation of cheap yen. And this is the leverage. The left chart shows the bank lending resumed to grow uh, bit by bit. And the right chart is a financial leverage ratio of the Japanese large corporations. Financial leverage is total assets divided by capital account, elevated uh, for the first time since the 1960s. 76. So therefore, the main reason why the relationship between the balance sheet and money supply has dramatically weakened because the corporate sector uh, just continued to deliver uh, in the last 15 years, there's some harbinger to be levered again. And lastly, the wage increase. Just uh, David introduced the beverage curve, uh, but I just uh, did the same uh, beverage curve analysis. Uh, the left chart, uh, just I decompose the unemployment into the structural one, the cyclical one. Uh, but uh, from the 19, uh, 2005 to 19, uh, 2006, uh, uh, the cyclical unemployment um, going down, but the unit uh, wage was just uh, uh, deflated because of the uh, regulational change. 
uh, the Koizumi government allowed the uh, temporary stuff uh, for the manufacturing company in 2005. So therefore, that is one of the reasons why the uh, labor market has been tightened at that time, but the wage is going down. Again, the deviation occurred again, but the uh, initiative taken by the new government, Abe, its government is totally different. They would like to incentivize the increase of the unit labor uh, the unit wage as far as there is some progress of the labor productivity. In the past, looking back in the last decade, uh, uh, when there is uh, some progress of the labor productivity, the Japanese corporations just use it as a cutting sales price, but maybe it's not a good idea to invite the uh, downward uh, spiral. So therefore, Abe put pressure upon the corporate managers to just uh, raise the uh, wage uh, after his uh, inauguration. Maybe time is up. Uh, the David says that the uh, uh, I may say Nikkei will be tripled. I don't say that, uh, but if, uh, <laughs> if there is some question, I'm happy to react, uh, but the time is up. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to break for lunch, and you can hunt down any speaker and ask them the difficult questions in the privacy of the lunchroom. Uh, lunch will be n next door. Lunch is next door. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> we'll meet back here in one hour.